Go beyond the headlines of what's happening now. This is Thinking Out Loud right here on 938 Now, keeping you in the know and on the go with more of the lunchtime discussions that matter. On today's edition, from education projects to business promotions, augmented reality and virtual reality art has been gaining in popularity. We're going to find out today about how widespread this is in Singapore and what its potential for growth really is because... We're asking if it contributes to a livelier arts scene. Yeah, that's right. You heard me right. Augmented reality and virtual reality and the arts scene. CEO of Mesh Minds, Kay Vasey, joins me. Kay was a speaker at the recent third annual Art World Forum event in Singapore. The theme for this year was sustainability. Kay, welcome aboard. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm curious to find out more myself as well. Uh, tell us more about the idea of blending these two worlds. I'm sure my listeners like, hang on a second, how is that possible? Yeah, so this is a super new thing. Um, and basically, at the beginning of 2017, Google uh, launched something called Tilt Brush. And they launched it, um, which is a virtual reality painting tool. I saw the videos. It looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. You can paint with light. You can paint in a volumetric space. You just w- swing your arms wildly around you and you're painting. And then the best thing is that you can give your headset to your friend and they can walk around in your painting. Wow. So that's like virtual. Re- uh, that's the virtual reality part. And then augmented reality towards the end of last year. Jeff Koons, for example, he's famous for his balloon dog sculptures. Yes. Um, he collaborated with Snapchat so that when you went to uh, New York Central Park, you were able to open the app and there you have, you know, this huge augmented reality balloon dog, which is pretty cool. It is. So it's kind of like creating this digital layer um, that either allows you to step inside something via virtual reality or see it on your device. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it just kind of superimposes it in the real world. Do people often ask, though, like, but hang on, this isn't real. It's not tactile. Can I? Yes, but it, but don't forget, we always start with the art in the first place. Yeah. We're not we're not in the business of, of saying that oh, digital art is is the end of traditional art. Right. First, you start with the art, then you augment. Whether you you allow someone to step inside that painting, mm. or whether you're creating another layer that then brings that artwork to life. So a normal static painting on the wall, when viewed through your device, can suddenly animate and then give you such a different experience. It, it's basically you know. We are thinking that immersive technology can actually redefine storytelling. Mm. It's, it's giving you that extra layer to give more messages, tell the, uh, the viewer something more about your painting. That's an important distinction. I'm glad you brought that up as well. Is there a market for that here in Southeast Asia, maybe? It's not so much at the moment thinking about um, buying a piece that you will hang on your wall. Yes. Although in the future, you could imagine that people wow. at home would have a massive LED screen that at any point they could just go up to with, it with a remote control and put, OK, now I want to look at this super cool, futuristic, you yeah. know, Chinese painting, but animating as we look at it. Yeah. And the next thing, I, you know, on my menu, I can select. We're not there yet. Mm. So how people are making money is by being commissioned to make installations at museums, uh, you know, schools, hotels, etc. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. I like that idea with the installation art pieces as well, because yeah. then you get the experience of if you had an, uh, any doubt about, oh, is this tactile or is this real? But, but when, then when you're walking through it, when you're in there in a different dimension and almost it feels like then you get to experience it totally. that's something else altogether yeah. and we're going to see more and more of like retail spaces and mm-hmm. um, new retail spaces for example like pile of our quarter are already in contact with us about could we have some kind of virtual reality exhibition you know where people can come through and and, and you know experience different things um, also augmented reality instead of just having their commission mural with your device, as you're walking past it, you can make it totally interactive. Oh, wow. You can even have these augmented reality interactive windows mm-hmm. that actually track people's heads so that as you're looking at it, it really genuinely looks like you're w- looking through a real window. Oh, my goodness. But it's all digital. It's the- fantastic. You're blowing my mind a little bit. <laughs> you kind of are. But part of that um, ability to pull that off successfully would be skill sets. Absolutely. Would the artists then have to take on new skills? And could this be a prohibitive factor for many artists? At the moment in Singapore, yes. And we don't have lots of de- degree courses that are teaching people creative technology. In mm. New York, for example, you know, Google has a whole team of creative technologists. Nice. They, you know, and the, all of these people have been through degree courses and all of these different experiences. We're just at the beginning here. 
But what's fantastic is that National Arts Council and IMDA are looking at specific grants to look, you know, really, really push forward on this art and technology movement. And therefore, there will be courses, there'll be access mm. to technology. Tool, what we need is tools and training. And then quite quickly, a lot of these, these technologies do have fairly high barrier to entry yeah. but actually through collaboration through mentorship through courses then quite quickly once you've just got the basics down and you know there's lots of youtube tutorials around these sure. days to teach yourself then you can really start to experiment but what we need is time and money to be able to experiment because mm. you know the cost of living is high yes and obviously time is money mm. so asking an artist to say hey spend some time learning about technology it could push the boundaries of your artistic medium it could allow you to reach so many more audiences it could actually allow you to start to understand your audience in terms of what they like because you with techno this technology layer you can start to track all mm. the data mm. of how long is someone dwelling right. at this particular painting, etc.? Are they taking a snap? Are they sharing it with their friends? And so on and but so on. But is the artist interested in that? I thought sometimes I think the, it's uh, art for art's sake. Uh, potentially, yes. But if you look at grants and, you know, funding, etc., you know, I used to work at the British Council. You take government money. You invest it in a British artist who journeys to Singapore to collaborate. But it's always about the metrics. Yeah. Pound for pound, how much are we actually spending from, you know, public money and therefore how many, you know, audience figures, bums on seats, etc. So we're able to obviously say, I can tell you how many people are dwelling at this particular, you know, interactive painting. But then more than that, I can start to say, well, it's actually better. It's more uh, attractive than the other one that we have across the hall. Okay. Then we can start to see, oh, audiences are more engaged in this type of augmented reality painting than that one over there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is important. Well, would that change the nature of the creativity then? That people will be producing stuff that they know would have more eyeballs drawn to it, yes. just like YouTube content creators do. Absolutely. So, so there is always that very fine line, right? And, and it's the same as those Instagrammable moments. Yes, right? yes. We're all talking about it right now. I think <laughs> there would needs to be that balance between creating something for Instagram or for an you know AR interactive wall for example I think it's just about having that additional layer that allows us to start to understand what people like in terms of art um, and what might kind of drive future trends yeah. so I think we should never be afraid of technology it's here to stay you know the robots are definitely coming they are and, and actually, they're here you know, yeah they're here and um, creativity is one of going to be one of the last things that we have that left as human beings that can that cannot be replicated actually um, by by technology not entirely anyway yes um, so I think you know I think artists should embrace that technology not create for technology mm -hmm. um, but certainly understand what technology can do in terms of pushing the boundaries of their artistic medium enabling them to give really strong impactful messaging yeah. um, and then also, you know reaching a global audience and that's also really important in Singapore we we are a tiny aisle it's a wonderful aisle um, but we need to also get our artists work more out there and if we can you know and from Mesh Mind's perspective it's not just create art for art's sake you can do that if you want you know game developers can create zombie games endlessly if you want but what we want to do is bring the art the technology and together for good so that you are we're asking all of our artists uh, next march exhibition at art science museum to look squarely at one or more of the un sustainable development goals mm. so that we can perhaps have a voice on the international stage Everyone's talking about it. The news that you just read out is, is re really so much centered around climate change. So what we're trying to do is say, if you're an artist who wants to learn about te technology, is there a way that you can also look at these really, really important challenges of our time mm. and then bring it home, bring it from an Asian perspective? Mm. Because ultimately, you know, Greenpeace, for example, have, have have reported that just by placing a VR experience at Glastonbury Music Festival, they doubled their signups. That's fantastic. That's a, a you know, t it transports you away to the rainforest. But we need more content come out from Asian creators to actually say, this is a global challenge, but we need to actually engage the Asian audience. How do we do that? So, for example, one of our installations next year is going to be Food Waste Monsters. Mm. Now, 
we could just make it generic food, but isn't it kind of more fun and more playful and more engaging for a Singapore audience to have a nasty lemak monster come at you on screen? Sure. Kind of like, or a chicken rice monster. And Identifiability. Like, oh. Identifiability. Absolutely. It's not someone else's problem. Yeah. You know, in the same way as, you know, we have this amazing oceans we make VR experience. It's all about plastic pollution. You know, we were commissioned by Facebook in Taiwan to make a Taiwanese Mandarin version of it. Mm. Although it's made by Singaporean VR animation right. studio called Warrior 9 VR. They're awesome. And they said, you know, ultimately we want to launch Oculus Rift in museums and schools, but we need local content. So can you make it just before you get plonked in the ocean to go diving and collecting your plastic? Can you make it so that you see Taipei 101 in the distance? You know, you see the Queen's Head Rock so that it's very, very clear to the Taiwanese viewers this is our problem too. This yes. is not just, oh, it's out there. It's a pollution problem that's actually not on our doorstep. So that's why it's so important to, to bring it home to that Asian audience and, and make these little kind of visual references to t transport that person away and say, yes, global challenge, but it's, it's really a challenge. We need to engage the local audience as well to actually act. And do we have to be mindful of that element of the localizing of the imputing the reality into the virtual is that some is that way people like you come in to remind the artist to how to do this yes absolutely that's that's whole part of our tra our, our training program mm. that you know lasts for you know and we we mentor along the way so it's you know the artist comes up with a a cause that they are caring about yeah they have they bring then their skills and we then sit with them and say okay you know, this potentially, this idea could be more of a virtual reality project, right. or this could be an augmented reality, or this one is more for 3D printing or Internet of Things. You know, this, all yeah. of these emerging technologies can be applied in different ways to tell that story in a more engaging way. And once you've got engagement increasing, you've got empathy increasing, and therefore a much higher chance of the response to the call to action. I'm a huge fan of the idea of cross-industry collaborations and cross-collaborations, and I see the potential for that here, clearly. Um, a lot of my main focus is in the healthcare industry, and I know virtual reality and augmented reality has helped surgeons conduct um, pre-surgery practice runs, for example, or look at hypotheticals in terms of how cancer cells can be targeted and dealt with. I'm curious. I mean, we don't, and I talk about medical research all the time. Sometimes the best outcomes happen by accident or by collaborations. Potentially, by encouraging collaborations, it could have a knock-on effect for everything from the healthcare industry to sustainability to really anything. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, VR has also been used in pain management. Yeah. You know, just by putting your headset on, like, transport yourself Phantom limb away. therapy and so on. Absolutely. So, you know, the power of it, I mean, we, we are literally only at the beginning. We're scratching the surface. And there has been no one clear winner yet either mm. in terms of headsets and so on. You know, Facebook's just, oh, sorry, Facebook and An uh, Oculus have just released their new um, untethered experience, you know, the, the, the Quest, which is fantastic. More and more of these experiences can then become multiplayer or you know in an education setting lots of children can put the headset on at one time mm. rather than it at the moment being quite a one by one experience right. as, as per the vibe and all that kind of stuff you yes know? so so it could really be the magic school bus it could be it really is. Like, today we're going to learn about pollution in slums and we're going to visit one of these slums in this part of the world everybody put on your headset here we go absolutely so the unicef has also reported that their clouds over sidra vr experience that takes you away to the syrian humanitarian conflict wow. it they again increase like the donations are doubling just after people do that VR experience. So I think, you know, we are really at the beginning. We're starting to scratch the surface. The UN has created UN VR purely to put grants available for more of this amazing um, immersive technology applied to development communications type projects. That's fantastic. Kate, you have blown my mind <laughs> and you got me really excited about the possibilities. Yes. Thank you for helping us think Thank out you. loud right here. I, I don't know, maybe one day with virtual reality, my listeners could be in the studio with me. Absolutely. Why not? Why? Not indeed. Uh, Kay Vasey is the Chief Connecting Officer of Mesh Minds, joining us on this edition of Thinking Out Loud. She was recently a speaker at the third annual Art World Forum event in Singapore. I'm Daniel Martin. Thank you so much for joining us. Go beyond the headlines.